lot of challenges out there. And I think as a Marine Corps, we need to be ready to respond to all those challenges. We're training now for contingencies or whatever may confront this nation in the future. When you are a nation uh, that survives off the global commons, then you need a force like the United States Marine Corps. States Marine Corps stands ready. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our coverage of Steel Night 2013. Live here at Red Beach in Camp Pendleton, California. I'm First Lieutenant Chris Harper with First Marine Division Public Affairs. Steel Night is a combined arms exercise featuring Marines and sailors from all elements of the Marine, ground Air, Mar Marine Air Ground Task Force, or MAGTAF. The amphibious landing we'll be watching this morning will officially kick off Exercise Steel Night with follow-on training events here at Camp Pendleton and at the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center in 29 Palms, California. Units participating in this 1st Marine Division exercise will include infantry battalions from 1st and 5th Marine Regiments, artillery from 11th Marine Regiment, 3rd Assault Amphibian Battalion, 1st Light Armor Reconnaissance Battalion, 1st Combat Engineer Battalion, 1st Tank Battalion, Combat Logistics Regiment 1, Combat Logistics Battalion 5, elements of the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing, and our Navy Brothers of Assault Craft Unit 5. For more on today's amphibious landing and exercise steel night, we now turn to Sergeant Alfred Lopez and his interview with the Commanding General of 1st Marine Division, Major General Ronald Bailey. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Sergeant Alfred Lopez. I'm a combat correspondent with 1st Marine Division Public Affairs. Today we have the Commanding General of 1st Marine Division, Major General Ronald Bailey, here to talk to us about Exercise Steel Night. Good morning, sir. Good morning. All right, sir, basically we're here to try and give the audience a better understanding of exactly what's going on with Exercise Steel Night and what it is, sir. Um, it's described as the, the return of the Marine Corps to its core competencies. Can you describe to us what those are, what our core competencies are, and how we've diverted from them for the past 10 years, sir. Well, let me uh, take you back uh, to state that uh, this year's Steel Knights a division level exercise. And it will give us an opportunity as a division to focus in on our division uh, command and control. When you start talking the core competencies of a division, we're talking offense, defensive operations, most importantly, amphibious operations. So for us, when we talk about uh, the transition back uh, after being involved in uh, OIF and OEF, that's the transition that we're talking about. Uh, to include such things as humanitarian disaster relief, uh, things of that nature. But uh, Steel Knight uh, started off as a, a armor exercise in the 90s and then evolved into a pre-deployment training exercise as our units were preparing to go into uh, OEF. And so uh, since that is on the drawdown, now we are focusing on division, division level uh, skills. All right, sir. When you entered the Marine Corps, sir, what was a large-scale training exercise like? And like you mentioned, it's changed a lot because of uh, OIF and OEF. Mm -hmm. Can you describe how that's changed? Yes, the, uh, the large-scale, what I would call or describe as a large-scale exercise, was uh, the uh, Combined Arms Exercise, better known as CACS. And so uh, we would all deploy at least a battalion uh, would deploy uh, 229 Palms with the regimental headquarters as the command element. Uh, so having that regimental uh, uh, headquarters as command element, we had uh, uh, representatives or, or the squadron, uh, the uh, MLG representative uh, in terms of uh, the battalion, uh, similar to what we have today in our combat logistics uh, battalion. So uh, that regimental headquarters uh, was responsible for integrating the MAGTAF and pulling the MAGTAF together. So the regimental headquarters is the MAGTAF uh, headquarters with uh, battalions. Uh, that exercise in, uh, in total uh, was a, gave us an opportunity to work on our combined arms, our combined arms skills. So that's uh, the difference. But uh, what we're doing today as we look at uh, exercise steel night is the beginning or kind of the forerunner 
uh, to our ITX, our integrated uh, training exercises. So, uh, but we're, we're doing it from a division level perspective uh, uh, during this uh, steel night. Right, um, obviously, the Marine Corps is a unique fighting force, as you know, sir. How are we uniquely equipped to address the future security needs of America, especially with regards to uh, our interests in the Pacific, sir? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. Uh, I'll start by saying the, uh, the United States is a global uh, maritime power. Uh, we're, we're the largest economy in the world. Uh, we, uh, when, you, when you think about it from a broad perspective, a, a big picture scope, uh, 21 of the 28 mega cities are no, near the littorials, basically about 62 miles away from the littorials. Large population centers are near the littorials. And so when you are a nation uh, that survives off the global commons, then you need a force like the United States Marine Corps, which is a force that has a naval character. You know, we're a naval force, and we're able to respond today with today's force. So this is where uh, training like uh, Steel Knight uh, at the division level is very, very important because as the ground combat element of a MEF uh, could very well be deployed uh, to uh, conduct operations uh, that uh, may secure uh, those littorials. So the Marine Corps is, in, in my perspective, is uh, uniquely uh, organized and qualified uh, to fill those uh, future roles. Partnership, capacity, and, and partnership building, these are the things that the Marine Corps, stabilizing force, we, we work uh, very well with joint. Uh, we, we create space uh, for the nation and for commanders in an environment. Sir? Regimental Landing Team 1 is going to be basically heading the landing onto the beach for uh, Exercise Steel Night. Mm -hmm. Could you describe the challenges of controlling an amphibious landing team as well as how chaotic is it to establish an actual uh, landing force operations center well, for RLT-1? One of the difficult things uh, about an amphibious operation is the coordination, and so that's why Steel Night is uh, very important. Uh, if, if I had uh, if I had a request to sign it would be to have more amphibious ships. Uh, we don't have enough amphibious ships uh, to be able to rehearse and train properly. Uh, but if I did, if I was king for a day, I would give that entire regimental landing team uh, the capacity or the opportunity to, to come ashore from uh, our amphibious ships. And so that's in how you organize, how you prepare. Uh, so for Steel Night, this would give us an opportunity to train to that. But the most important thing, uh, as I said, in, in an amphibious operation is the command and control. Uh, having a good command and control allows you uh, to be able to make those changes that are required or uh, move a force here or there to respond. It gives you that adaptability that you need on an amphibious operation. Uh, RLT-1 uh, has been and is a part of uh, first uh, MEB. So this gives them an opportunity to train to their core competence and enhance their overall skills in amphibious operations uh, from everything uh, to uh, the command and control, uh, the uh, ground combat element, uh, the logistics aspect of it, and the aviation aspect of it. All those are critical parts of an amphibious operation. And, and so creating uh, that, that uh, lodgment requires uh, that they train to those skill sets. Sir, so this year's exercise is currently it is going to be in conjunction with uh, Exercise Valiant Mark as well, where the Singaporeans are with uh, 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines. Yes. They're training right now. How are you planning to uh, integrate the Singaporeans into uh, Exercise Steel Night, and why is that important for us? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier when I was talking about the, uh, the U.S. and its it being a global uh, maritime nation, part of what we do as a Marine Corps is that we work with our partners. We build that capacity. Uh, a unique strength of the United States Marine Corps when we are, you know, we're organized as a Marine Air Ground Task Force, as a MAGTAF, is that we have the ability uh, to move from, from ship to shore. Uh, by moving from ship to shore, it, uh, it gives us an opportunity to, we, we create, we have a very light footprint. And so as we're building uh, the, the partnership with our host nations, uh, sharing with them our skill set, they share with us theirs also, we're able to uh, establish a relationship that we may need or may uh, in the future uh, be a, a force uh, that's working together, for example, on humanitarian disaster relief. Uh, Tomodachi come to, to mind when you start talking uh, 
uh, the, the last HADR type of operation, humanitarian disaster relief type of operation. So when we have the opportunity in an exercise such as uh, Valiant Mark to work with the Singaporeans, that gives us a great opportunity to, one, share with them our, uh, our command and control, our systems and how we do things, uh, share with them our lessons learned. We have a, a force of Marines who are combat trained, so we can share those lessons with them and, 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 and talk to them and, and show them how we do different things. And then we learn the same from them uh, as we watch how they, they work through different skill sets and challenges uh, that we have in front of us. Valiant Mark is a very, very good exercise. It's just one of many uh, that we're involved in in terms of the partners all over the uh, Asian Pacific region. That's true. Um, Large-scale wildfire exercises were the, the staple of the Marine Corps during the 1990s. Or, uh, what do you think are the biggest benefits of a large-scale exercise like Steel Night? Well, let me go back and kind of modify that just a little bit. Um, we, uh, as I said before, we had regimental headquarters that would go out. Uh, First Division had, in fact, uh, gone out on large-scale exercises. And even when I was in Second Division, we did some of the same things. And so over the last 12 years, we have not had that opportunity because of the counterinsurgency fight, the coin fight. Uh, the great value and benefit of, of an exercise of this nature is you get out and you're able to exercise your command and control. And then you're able to uh, more or less uh, stretch your systems, test your systems to make sure that, uh, that you can talk to your units. For example, I have 1st Marines here at Camp Pendleton. I have 5th Marines over at 29 Palms. So, you know, that, that's a pretty broad area uh, in which the division is spread, but uh, most importantly, it gives us an opportunity to, to work all of our systems, uh, to work our HF, our VHF, our SATCOMs, uh, use data links and uh, CPOP, all those things that we need to control a fight or to, uh, uh, or, or to look at things across a range of military operations in any theater. That's right. Exercise Steel Night this year is generating a lot of media interest, or more than the previous years. Is there a specific message you want to deliver to the public well, yes. during Steel Night? Yeah, the message that I want to deliver to the public is that the United States Marine Corps stands ready. Uh, when the nation is least ready, the United States Marine Corps will be ready. That's the first uh, uh, thing I would like to pass off to the American uh, public. Then the uh, other thing that I would like to say is that uh, we're training uh, now for contingencies or whatever may confront this nation in the future. And so the Marines and sailors that are involved in Steel Night uh, take a lot of pride in uh, doing that and, and training to those core competencies as I talked uh, mentioned earlier. So uh, what I would say is that the United States Marine Corps stands ready uh, to uh, meet the challenges of the future and will be ready when the nation's least ready. That's here. Just switch my question. Sir, when you think about the future of the Marine Corps, as we move forward in the 21st century, uh, what topics are most on your mind? As I uh, think about the future, uh, the number one thing that comes to mind is amphibious operations. I need ships to train with. That's the first thing that comes to mind. My units need ships to train with. So those are the type of things that I'm thinking about. But uh, when I think about the Asian Pacific Theater, what I, I think about is uh, partner capacity. I think about training with our, our partners and our allies in that region uh, so that when something happens, it won't be the first time that we're seeing each other. It's not the first time when we're talking about the Marine Corps planning process or it's not the first time when they'll see uh, my Marines and sailors. And so when you have that type of relationship, it makes uh, for moving into a, a very difficult situation, a very challenging situation like an HADR or an offensive uh, type operation, it makes it a lot better when you have had an opportunity to train together such as Valiant, uh, Mark, and you have seen each other's SOPs, the standard operating procedures. So that's, that's the thing that I think about uh, when I start thinking about the future and where we're going in terms of the Asian Pacific uh, theater. There are a lot of challenges out there, and I think as a Marine Corps, we need to be ready to respond to all those challenges. Like you mentioned, sir, uh Exercise Steel Night has a lot of moving parts. Obviously, we're here in Camp Pendleton, then we're, we're with the uh, 5th Marines over at uh, mm -hmm. 29 Palms. What parts of the exercise are you most looking forward to seeing? Well, uh, for me, 
getting down and talking to the Marines, the, the Lance Corporals and PSCs, uh, because they're extremely very talented and they, they, are, they know their job and they take a lot of pride in showing you and demonstrating to you that they know your job. So uh, I'm looking forward to getting out uh, with our battalions. Uh, I'm also uh, extremely pleased and uh, I, I offer my best to uh, CLR one with a large number of, of assets that they put out in the field. So uh, while we are looking at this as a division level exercise, uh, the elements of uh, MLG, uh, third M uh, first MLG, uh, CLR one that's providing the support that we need, really tremendous support. I mean, thousands and thousands, roughly about 2,000 uh, Marines and sailors uh, from the Combat Logistics Regiment one. You, you talked a little bit about the, uh, the junior Marines and wanting to see them and how talented they are. During counterinsurgency operations, sir, those junior Marines were instrumental in delivering the commander's intent mm -hmm. all the way down to the lowest level. Mm -hmm. Do you anticipate any change as far as the roles of those junior Marines when, when it comes to amphibious landing operations? Well, I, I will say that uh, when we start talking about the uh, Lance Corporals and the Corporals and the PSCs and those Marines uh, and their role in uh, counterinsurgency operations, more from a distributive oper uh, operations perspective, it was that type of uh, uh, strategic corp of very smart, sharp uh, Marine that carried the day. They will continue to carry the day because it's leadership at the lowest levels uh, that accomplish the mission. And so when they understand the intent of any operation, it, uh, it helps everyone. So I'm very proud of uh, those Marines because one, they're very talented, they know their trade, and they take the initiative, and they have never failed to accomplish a mission. So they add to the legacy of our Corps uh, through their professionalism and hard work and dedication. All right, sir. Is there anything else about Exercise Steel Night or Valiant Mark that you'd like to talk about, sir? Uh, well, I'm uh, very pleased uh, with what has happened thus far. And uh, my uh, bravo Zulu to my staff and to all the commanders and the Marines and sailors for making this a very successful operation. Thank you for your time, sir. That concludes our interview with 1st Marine Division's Commanding General, Major General Ronald Bailey, and our conversation with him about Exercise Steel Night. Welcome back. That was Sergeant Alfred Lopez with the Commanding General, 1st Marine Division, Major General Ronald Bailey. As we speak, Marines from 3rd Assault Amphibian Battalion are chugging towards the shoreline behind me, and that means it's time to bring out our first guest. He has served as on the 11th Marine Expeditionary Unit, he has conducted three deployments in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom, and he has served as an amphibious operations expert in military, military aid in the U.S. House of Representatives. Here with me now is Lieutenant Colonel Howard Hall, the Commanding Officer of 3rd Assault Amphibian Battalion. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Hello, good morning. Thank you for having me out here today. Sir, uh, we're very happy that you can come out here and share some of your knowledge and expertise with us. And first of all, I'd like you, you to tell us and the viewers at home, you know, what is the mission of 3rd Assault Amphibian Battalion? Okay, the mission of the 3rd Assault Amphibian Battalion is to provide amphibious lift and battlefield mobility to the ground combat element of the Marine Air Ground Task Force. Now, put more simply, we can carry, each vehicle can carry 18 combat-loaded infantrymen or combat support or humanitarian assistance supplies from the ship to the shore to objectives inland and all the way back to amphibious shipping. This is a service defining capability for the Marine Corps and it's unique. It is applicable across the entire range of military operations. Like I said, from the low end, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, through the high end, joint forcible entry operations. Could you give us a couple examples and the folks at home, could you give them a couple examples of each of these types of operations that your battalion is capable of performing, sir? Sorry. Absolutely. There are five missions. There is the amphibious assault, which is carrying combat forces from ship to shore through a defended beach to take an objective inland. There is the amphibious raid. A raid is a uh, limited objective assault. The raid uh, would typically just be short in duration, followed by an immediate withdrawal. There is the amphibious withdrawal. Uh, this took place in 1993, uh, evacuating UN troops from the coast of Somalia. Okay, there's the amphibious demonstration. Uh, we participated in this in 1991. This was a critical part of our mission in support of uh, Desert Storm. Could you tell me a little bit more about that, sir? As I understand it, there was a very large Iraqi force during that. that was, their focus was actually turned over to the amphibious capabilities the Marine Corps was, was providing at that point. That is correct. Because of the amphibious force off of the coast of Kuwait, 
This forced the Iraqis to move what is estimated to have been six divisions to defend against a, uh, an assault that could take place. The threat of the assault shifted the Iraqi forces away from our main assault, which was on land. And the very last one is uh, uh, operations other than war. In this case, it's humanitarian assistance and disaster response. Now, what is interesting and what a lot of people do not know is in 2005, in our own homeland, in response to the, the uh, uh, disaster Hurricane Katrina caused, two assault amphibian vehicles saved 263 lives in the first 48 hours after that disaster had taken place. Like I said, this vehicle is completely unique and it is very uh, versatile and flexible in the fact that it can uh, support the Marine Corps' mission across almost the entire range of military operations. Sir, you're absolutely right. That was uh, one fact I did not know about the uh, Hurricane Katrina disaster. That's actually kind of incredible. Well, you, you know, moving on from there, there's all these capabilities that your battalion brings to the table, all these things that they've done in the past, but it really comes down to the Marines and sailors within your battalion that actually make this happen. Could you tell me a little bit about them? Who makes up uh, third tracks? Absolutely. I'm very proud of the Marines and sailors who make up the battalion. There's uh, just a little over 1,400 Marines and sailors broken into six companies five line companies, five companies that operate the AAV and a headquarters and service company. There are over 36 different MOSs, military occupational specialties, that make up the battalion, but the majority of the battalion is the 1833, the Assault Amphibian Vehicle Crewmen. Okay. Uh, the Marines who are operating these vehicles we see out in the water behind us right now, and keeping those vehicles running is the 2141, the Assault Amphibian maintainer, the mechanics who keep these 41-year-old vehicles running. Those seem like the heart and soul of the battalion. Because Absolutely. Them, they're not going anywhere. But, and and I, I got to tell you, though, every MOS is required to make this battalion run. Uh, uh, supply, communications, our armorers, all the way across. It takes every single piece, like a Swiss watch, Every piece has meaning, and that's what it takes to keep this battalion running. And for exercise steel night, sir, though, I know behind me we have your, I believe, Bravo company that's chugging towards the that's shore right now. Is there another company that's actually participating in this exercise as well? Uh, that is correct. Charlie Company is out in the 29 Palms version of it. Uh, uh, this is unique. This is the first time in all the years that Steel Night has been run that it is split between a Camp Pendleton portion and a 29 Palms portion. And just for the viewers at home, to give them a little more perspective, what is your, uh, since this is a completely different mission than what's going on here with an amphibious landing, what is your Charlie company going doing in 29 Palms? Uh, they're doing a live fire and maneuver exercise at the Marine Corps Air Ground Combat Center in 29 Palms. Uh, because it's not contiguous according to our map, but uh, on the scenario it is contiguous in that uh, they would be conducting the follow-on missions. This is the critical phase right here, uh, getting the forces ashore, establishing a lodgment, which means creating an opening for the rest of the MAGTAF to come ashore. Uh, that is what's going on behind us right now. Charlie Company, because they're up in 29 Palms right now, is going to be conducting that follow-on mission. Well, that sounds good, sir. Um, now, all this we're talking about, the Marines, the Marines and sailors that are working hard to keep these vehicles running, I'd like to discuss a little bit of the capabilities of these craft, if you would. Just give me a brief overview of what, what an AAV is capable of. An assault amphibian vehicle is capable of approximately 60 miles an hour on land. It can keep up with the M1 Abrams tank. It can accomplish six to eight knots in the water. It's got a 171 gallon fuel tank on it, which can get us seven hours in the water or 300 miles on land. Well, sir, I hate to interrupt you, but can you describe what's happening right here? You see on our monitor, looks like it's from the, uh, the uh, troop commander turret. You are correct. Okay, if you can go ahead and describe it. Okay, absolutely. Like I said, this is the critical phase of the operation. Uh, these vehicles are coming ashore with either 18 combat loaded infantrymen or 10,000 pounds of cargo. They have just hit the beach. Uh, we have leveraged reconnaissance assets to the best of our ability. We may have, uh, the MAGTAF may have inserted some reconnaissance elements on the beach to report uh, directly to us to give us an idea what we're coming up against. But with a 50 caliber machine gun and a 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher in the turret of that vehicle, which you can just about see right there in the right. shot, sir, they, they can uh, defend themselves. Sir, it looks like we got another shot from the beach there. And we have more. This is the rest of the first wave of AVs that are coming in. This is uh, your first platoon from Bravo Company, I believe. That's correct. And I, I've got to tell you, the first wave is the critical wave. They are going to gain and maintain the momentum of the operation. Uh, they're, they're just like the offensive line on a football team. 
uh, they will uh, shape everything that happens from here forward in the operation. Oh, I see. Well, hey, now as, as they're moving in, as they're moving in, sir, what, what are they? What are these Marines doing as they prepare, prepare the beach for the follow-on uh, waves of the AEDs? Absolutely. Uh, if there are any uh, coastal defenses, if there are any forces on the beach, they're using that weapon system you can see right there in the shot uh, to try and neutralize and negate any enemy defenses and move forward as quickly as possible. And I'd like to pause real quick and remind all the viewers here, our audience at home, that there's actually no live fire going on at the beach this morning. Oh, that, that's correct. Yes, this, there'll be no fire in this landing. So that's the first wave of the landing with AVs. And actually now I'd like to get back to the capabilities of the AVs and um, go, to a, go to a report by our own uh, Sergeant Jacob Carr. We can get that loaded up here. Right now you're seeing AVs on Red Beach. Here's another one chugging in, sir. Absolutely. It, it may be interesting to note that the vehicle's 11 feet high. In the water, it's got a nine-foot draft. So really, there's only about two feet of the vehicle up above the water. Okay. Now, sir, when they are coming in, I know that there's an open hatch on the top of the AEVs, but when they're in the water, what is it? What, uh, is that closed? Because there are Marines inside. Oh, that's correct. Uh, all hatches are closed, and it, it uh, uses an air aspirator valve, so... It's only going to take in uh, uh, air uh, through the uh, mushroom valve, is what they call it, the aspirator valve. Uh, to keep the engine cool, though, it uses a contact cooler on the bottom of the vehicle, uh, which uses thermal diffusivity. It keeps itself cool in the water more effectively. But uh, the, the point I was getting to with uh, uh, the draft, 11-foot vehicle, 9 feet of it's underwater, as you saw. It's actually, I don't want to use the word stealthy because that has its own connotations but the vehicle sits low in the water and the engine noise uh, uh, from the turbo is actually dissipated down into the water. It can make a somewhat stealthy approach just before first light. Well, I know we're sitting up here, sir, and I certainly couldn't hear anything coming on the beach right now, so that's definitely effective. Sir, if you take a look at the AVs right now, can you point out the different positions in that in, in, the, uh, in the AV? Okay, similar to, uh, to a car that we would be driving, the front driver's side, the left-hand side, or the, I guess the port side as we'd say it, uh, that's the driver. Directly behind the driver is the troop commander. Uh, that is the Marine who is responsible for the embarked infantry. Uh, senior infantryman sits right behind the driver, and uh, you can see up in the uh, elevated position is the turret. That is the crew chief of the vehicle. He's responsible for the vehicle, employing the vehicle safely, and getting the infantry to where they need to be to execute their mission. And the crew chief on each vehicle, typically what rank is that for the Marine? That's typically a corporal, a non-commissioned officer, so he is responsible for a vehicle that is in excess of $1 million each, plus employing the weapon system, the 50 caliber machine gun and the 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher, and he's responsible for the maintenance, upkeep, employment, and the safety of that vehicle and that crew. And as a, as a Obviously a non-commissioned officer, he's, he's been in for a few years at that point. Where would, where would a Marine like that start? Where would he start in the AAV community to get to be a crew chief? Typically the junior position, a, a brand new 1833 amphibious vehicle crewman, is in the rear. He's the rear crewman. Uh, every time these vehicles stomp, they take a tactical halt. That is the Marine who goes out and checks the suspension, makes sure that the vehicle's uh, running fine on the outside. He's also responsible for the uh, embarked infantry making sure they've got uh, their positions in the back of the vehicle and that they are riding safely and also helping them get out when it's time to dismount and take the objective. The next senior position is the driver. So they go from rear crewman to driver. Uh, that, that Marine has got to go through an awful lot of training on land and in the water. The toughest part is getting on and off of an amphibious ship. That's typically the Lance Corporal, and if, uh, if they succeed there and they, a, they, they progress in their careers, they'll make their way up to the Corporal Crew Chief. And that's where, the, and that's where that Marine is sitting right there. That's Absolutely. There, there's a, a lot of responsibility as the Crew Chief. And now each, each crew seat, how many, how many um, AAVs are in a platoon, sir? There, there's typically 12. Okay. Uh, a MU platoon uh, that we'd send on the Marine Expeditionary Unit would have three more that would have its own communications variant and its own recovery variant. Those are the three variants of the AAVs. I need to stop here real quick, but what is the communications variant? What can that be used for? They, well, they all have a common chassis, but instead of uh, one large uh, cargo or troop carrying compartment, that chassis is filled with communications equipment. That provides uh, command, control, and situational awareness for the battlefield commander. The supported infantry commander uh, is going to have a bank of radios, 
uh, computers and uh, uh, network connectivity uh, to provide him that situational awareness and that command and control that's vital in the digital battlefield. Well, this, while we're talking about this command and control variation of, of your AVs, now today your Bravo company is out here. Captain John Kim is your Bravo company commander. That's correct. That right? He's going to be out there, and that can, uh, typically with, uh, with a uh, with a landing like this, the company commander would usually be in the same would be in the command and control variant with the ground forces commander. Is that accurate? It really depends on the uh, scenario and how the the supported commander would like to employ his assets. It's really up to the supported commander. Uh, a company commander like Captain John Kim would be uh, an advisor, and if uh, if the supported commander wants his advisor in that vehicle with him, that's where he's going to be. Otherwise, uh, he's uh, really focused more on the safe employment, the tactical employment of those assets. So. That's very, that's interesting, sir. And not a lot of people know this. A lot of people do know that the Marine Corps is based on infantry, and everything we do is surrounded is around infantry. Your your MOS and your your community is, of course, combat arms, but you're still in support of the grunts on the ground of the infantry. That's an interesting relationship. Could you just talk about that a little bit more? Well, I've got to tell you, it, it's it's a valuable relationship uh, because we have got to understand. Uh, the infantry scheme of maneuver in their terms in order to best support that scheme of maneuver. Uh, so uh, it, th this partnership is forged all the way in the beginning of our training and uh, it's an exercise like Steel Knight that allows us to put it together on a large scale. Uh, we're able to conduct these, uh, these combined exercises, uh, mechanized infantry is what we call it when we have the infantry on board with us. Uh, it, we can do that at the, at the lower levels, but this opportunity is enormous for us. It, it puts all those small building blocks together and allows us to uh, reinforce our SOP, standard operating procedures, and our tactics, techniques, and procedures in a large scale and dynamic environment. All right, sir. Well, now as you can take a look at the monitor, it looks like we have this first wave is in and they've uh, established pretty good security. They've, they have uh, established security on the beach right now. Now, once the next wave starts coming in, what is the next move for this first platoon? Okay, well, the, the first wave there, they've got to conduct that initial security. They've got to uh, neutralize any enemy defenses on the beach. And uh, as you see, they're going to start moving forward as those follow-on waves uh, uh, expand that security perimeter. And we can begin uh, uh, bringing in the connectors. The landing craft air cushion is, is a Navy vessel. It's very fast. It has a tremendous amount of capability, but it can't leave the beach. It also has no actual defenses. It's no, it doesn't have any weapons on it. So that's the critical role of the assault amphibian vehicle, to secure that beachhead, to expand that perimeter, and to facilitate the follow-on of uh, combat forces through that perimeter to objectives inland, and also to uh, facilitate the safe landing of the landing craft air cushion, the LCAC, and the uh, landing craft utility, the LCU. Sir, you mentioned the LCAC's landing craft air cushion. They're actually going to be coming in a little, a little bit later here with following forces from uh, First Light Armor Reconnaissance Battalion. Take a look at the monitor here. Go. Got some more pictures coming in. That okay, that's the crew chief right there. Uh, he's uh, uh, providing the situational awareness to the other vehicles. Uh, back to the company commander, John Kim. And he's also communicating that to his supported infantry commander. Now, looking at the crew, crew chief here, what, I can see uh, weapons in, the, in that turret right there. Tell the people at home exactly okay. what those are. Again, the one that's closest to us, as far as the screenshot is concerned, is the Mark 19 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher. Uh, the one on the far side, uh, the right hand side, is as the crew chief is looking at it. Uh, that is the Mark II 50 caliber machine gun. Uh, they are coaxially mounted, which means that uh, with a common periscope, uh, you can sight in both weapons. They don't have independent sights, but uh, coaxially mounted, you can use that same periscope sight to engage targets. So there's one, one Marine sitting in that turret seat engaging right. with, both, with both weapons. And, and that's the crew chief, which makes that position, uh, that a lot of responsibility in that position. Let's just put it that way. All right, sir. Now it looks like we're on the same same AAV and we have the view of the driver. Is that right? Okay, that is the driver. And they are, uh, it looks like they're heading our direction. They, they are most definitely heading our direction. Uh, to operate an AAV, it's actually Similar to operating a car, it's got a steering wheel, it's got a shift lever uh, with your forward and your reverse gears, a brake and a gas pedal. Here's the opposite angle of that, sir. Can you tell me just a little bit about the formation you see here? Okay, they're in a column formation because they're uh, 
the space available is actually limited. They've got uh, the water on their left side as they're driving this way, and they've got some brush on their right. So a column formation is used just to get off the beach as quickly as possible. Uh, based on what they've seen down there, they have neutralized any beach defenses. Uh, they've overcome any enemy obstacles that were present down there, and they're making best speed to get off the beach and start moving up to those uh, uh, additional objectives. All right, so now once they've moved, moved up the beach, be sure there was no enemy at that position, they're going to move on, and the next, fall, the wave, next wave of uh, uh, Bravo Company should be coming onto the beach shortly. That's correct. Okay, sir. Well, it looks like we have uh, we have now the first wave of Bravo Company has now moved almost directly on our position. We can actually look behind us. Right. Okay. They're actually setting up a second perimeter. Uh, I'm not in communication with uh, the the supported commander on the ground, so we can only guess based on what we're seeing. But uh, what we're looking at right now is they're setting up a second perimeter to expand uh, that security zone to uh, expand that beach landing site. Well, and speaking of right now, sir, while we're, while they're pausing security hall, can you tell me what, what kind of things the Marines are doing inside the AVs to prepare for the next 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 event they need to go to? Okay, as far as the assault amphibian uh, crewmen, the 1833s and the 2141s, they've taken a thorough assessment of the mechanical abilities within the vehicle. Was there any damage during the landing? Uh, do they need to uh, 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 make any repairs before they move in? Check the status of uh, your fuel systems. Check the status of uh, your weapon systems, your ammunition. Before they make that push off the beach, they need to make sure they are 100% up and ready to go. The infantry is also passing uh, messages back and forth on their tactical communications networks as far as updating the enemy picture. Uh, have we gotten any additional intelligence feeds uh, that will describe what they're going to face once they get further inland. That's all happening right now. All right, sir. It sounds like a lot going on right now. I actually like to uh, cut the discussion short right now. We're going to go to okay. a pack. We're going to go to a report. Right now, we're going to be going to a uh, report from uh, Sergeant Jacob Parr. He spent a week with your battalion. Uh, he got to see all the capabilities and everything that goes into uh, uh, everything to uh, make an AAV run. We're going to go to a report from Sergeant Jacob Parr on the uh, capabilities of AAVs. Thank you. Now they're just showing off. When the Marines need to take a beach, the amphibious assault vehicle gets them there. Second Lieutenant Connor Murphy commands a platoon of AAVs. He understands the capabilities it brings to the fight. So we can establish a foothold on the beach. Each AAV has a 50 caliber machine gun and a Mark 19 fully automatic grenade launcher. It allows us to create a great deal of depression on the enemy, create a good standoff distance, and allow the infantry to assault through the objective on the beach. Introduced in the 1970s, the AAV remains the key component of the Corps' amphibious strategy. It can move more than 20 Marines in their gear. It has several advantages over other troop transports, like helicopters and hovercrafts. We're able to splash in less than favorable conditions. With air assets, they're usually looking at a very narrow scope. That allows commanders greater flexibility in planning an amphibious operation. After landing on the beach, the vehicle can travel up to 200 miles without refueling, giving the infantry the firepower to Sergeant Jacob Hare for that report, and we're going to go back to our discussion on AAV capabilities. And sir, we saw in that report, uh, one thing I thought was really interesting and we didn't get to see today is actually the AAVs disembarking from the amphibious shipping. Could you walk us through that, tell the folks at home exactly what's that like? Okay, absolutely. Uh, uh, we had a chance to talk about uh, the relationship between the assault amphibian vehicle crewmen and the infantrymen. Well, there is an equally important relationship that we form with our Navy brethren. Uh, the, the 
two toughest things of operating an assault amphibian vehicle is getting onto an amphibious ship and getting off. Uh, we rely heavily on the, uh, the seamen, uh, the, the Navy uh, uh, sailors who are uh, controlling our operations inside of the well deck. It's, it's a 26-ton mechanized ballet inside of a very small area inside of those amphibious ships. Uh, but uh, we have a tremendous relationship with the Navy as far as preparing the vehicles. That would, that would have happened uh, probably about midnight uh, with the refueling the vehicles, preparing the vehicles, staging the vehicles inside of the well deck of an amphibious ship, uh, red lights on, uh, and then just before first light, we see the ramp go down. Uh, it's the stern gate, actually. The stern gate goes down. Uh, we're, they, they point us in the right direction toward our objective beach, and uh, the red lights turn green, and we begin uh, launching those vehicles. And again, 26 tons moving in a very confined space. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of adrenaline pumping at that moment. And uh, they actually flood the well deck of the ship. They get uh, about three feet of water in the back of the ship that allows us to float our way out. Well, and we're talking about this well deck. Exactly how big is a well deck? How many of your AVs can actually fit in there at one time? Well, it depends on the class of the ship, but typically we can go three vehicles across, so three vehicles side by side, and launch one at a time. But uh, depending on how much space is available, we prefer to do two. Okay. What, and, and we just launch in tandem, one left, one right, about 15 to 30 seconds apart. And if that wasn't complicated enough, as I understand it, you launch before first light, sometimes both right. ships in pitch black. How, did, how does that work? How, well, can your, how can your Marines drive in those kind of conditions? Again, uh, it takes a lot of training, a lot of practice, but what's happening is the ship that's in charge is called the PCS, the primary control ship. Uh, inside of the ship itself, there's something called the CIC, the Combat Information Center. And uh, using a radar, they will track our movements. And so as the radar spins, they'll see where we are in the water uh, compared to where we're supposed to be in the water and they will call us on the radio and provide guidance uh, left right speed up slow down to get us inside of a boat lane that's about 500 yards wide and that boat lane is cleared of mines or any type of uh, obstacles so they will steer us into that boat lane to get us into center beach to get us into that landing that we just witnessed about 15 minutes ago. Now this morning, before when it was pitch black out here, before the sun came up, both you and I were out here watching this yes. uh, as your AVs chugged out of the water. It was dark. Are they using any kind of night vision equipment when they actually do these kind of movements at night? Can you explain that? Absolutely. There are uh, night vision uh, devices mounted inside of the vehicles, uh, driver enhancement display, a thermal sight inside of the turret. And we combine that with our own uh, our own handheld uh, night vision goggles, and uh, they they may use that. Uh, they'll use anything, ambient light. But uh, as far as navigating, it's hard to do in the water. There there are very few visual references, especially in the in the pitch black. That's why we completely rely on the United States Navy, on the primary control ship, to give us those vectors, to give us that guidance to get us in. So it sounds like a lot of stuff that goes into these, actually making these things run. We have a tremendous amount of capability that we've already talked about and that we've actually seen, you know, going on on the beach behind us right now. Right. What I'd like to get into is the Marines and the sailors and all the work they've actually put into making these uh, machines run. I understand there's a ton, a ton of, uh, of maintenance that actually goes into that. Could you, could you tell the people at home a little bit about that? Absolutely. It, it's, a, it's a very large uh, vehicle, like I said, 26 tons, uh, uh, 525 horsepower Cummings turbo diesel engine in a chassis that's 41 years old so it's it's late some wear and tear going on. it's 1960s technology being driven by 1990s vintage marines <laughs> so i've got to tell you the professionalism that these marines display every single day uh, is, is truly impressive this is a large-scale exercise there's no doubt about that but to make this happen the way it is right now they've got to put the heart and soul into their work every single day that they're out there. And on a daily basis, how much how much maintenance actually goes into these kind of things? Uh, the general guideline is four hours of maintenance for every one hour of operation. Wow. That's a general guideline. That's uh, that's pretty incredible. Well, you know, I, as I'm getting getting a word in my ear here, I think we actually have another report from Sergeant Jacob Hare 
um, discussing all the maintenance that actually goes into these AAVs. So right now I'd like to cut to that report from uh, Sergeant Jacob okay. Perry. It's an assault vehicle. Um, in layman's terms, it's pretty much a, a tank that goes in the water. Um, they're used for transporting infantry um, from naval ships to shore for assault and things like that. Um, weighs about 56,000 pounds. Um, pretty much a major And tighten up any loose bolts. If a piece comes off while I see, Tiny hole can cost right. thousands of gallons of water to flow into the, the vehicle, uh. enough to sink it. Uh, maintainers, our job is to ensure the vehicles can continue training anytime something breaks down. Um, we've got to assess the situation, identify what we need to fix it, um, and get the vehicles up as best we can so they can continue training. That often means late nights. Freezing cold, you're exhausted, you know, ready to hit the rack, and then something goes down, and you gotta jump out, and you've got headlamps or you know someone holding a flashlight, um, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Reporting from Camp Pendleton, California, I'm Marine Sergeant Jacob Harlan. Welcome back to our live coverage of Exercise Steel Night on Red Beach here in Camp Pendleton, California. I'm Lieutenant Harper, still sitting here with. Lieutenant Colonel Howard Hall, the commanding officer of 3rd Assault Amphibia Battalion. And sir, we just saw a package from Sergeant Jacob Parr on the maintenance that goes into these AABs. Now, some of the stuff that we were watching here, and the folks at home might not necessarily know, is that these are actually tracked vehicles. They're yes. in the water. They're like tanks in the water, so they actually have tracks when they're on land. Can you talk about that a little bit? That's it. it, it like I said, it's, it's a unique vehicle. It adds to the complexity of maintaining it, but uh, in the water, it's propelled by a water jet impeller, similar to a jet ski, uh, that it'll, it'll suck the water into a bell housing and an, and an internal prop will compress it and force it out the back. That's what propels it forward. On land, right. it's got tracks. Now, I gotta ask though, yes. how much more powerful is this than a jet ski? Because <laughs> I don't think people at home are gonna try to be able to hop in and on their jet ski and get and move through the water, this, move this much weight through the water. No, I'm not sure how many horsepower a jet ski has, but this has the 525 uh, horsepower Cummings diesel engine uh, providing all of that thrust to get 26 tons, a 26 ton block right. straight through the water. Now once this, once we actually see that uh, impeller get to the beach, now we hit the beach and we're, we're, we're rolling on tracks. Can you tell me about some of the maintenance that actually goes into that? Because in, in the video, in the report from Sergeant Harr, we saw Marines getting out and, and tightening lug nuts on those tracks seemingly every time they stop. Every single time they stop. That's the uh, duty of the rear crewman under the supervision of the crew chief uh, to get out and check uh, the, the bolts on each of the road wheels to check the track tension. If there's too much track tension, it can break. If there's not enough track tension, it'll slap up and down against the chassis of the vehicle and eventually throw the track off of, uh, off of the guide wheels. Right. And that's not a good thing. That's a very long uh, repair. And they do this whenever they have some downtime. Is it just because of the weight of the vehicle and also the age of the vehicle? Just it's it's the it weight necessary. and the age and the importance of the mission right. uh, because uh, the, it's important to keep that vehicle running just by itself. But, you know, we, we've got some important cargo, 18 combat-loaded infantrymen in the back of that vehicle, and we've got to get them to the objective safely. I think uh, what, what's also uh, interesting is that uh, it could also be getting that humanitarian assistance to that area where and when needed. We, we talked about the tracks and the impellers. This vehicle has three modes of operation. Water jets, which is just the jet impellers. Uh, water tracks, which is both the impellers and the tracks itself. And then just land mode with the tracks only. Um, that kind of versatility is what allowed us to save all those lives uh, in, the, in the wake, in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, because employing the jets and the tracks at the same time, uh, we can go through bodies of water, uh, we can climb over crumbled infrastructure, fall, fallen trees, fallen power lines, broken walls. Uh, this vehicle can go across a six foot span, it can climb a three foot vertical wall, uh, and it can do so just on the move. 
And those kind of things were, have been put to use not only, as you said, humanitarian op operations, but traditionally non-amphibious areas of places like, like Iraq, like the initial fa uh, phase of Operation Iraq. Absolutely, yeah. We, we can a operate... history lesson on that? Absolutely. We can operate in, in a riverine environment as well. Uh, with This vehicle was the prime mover for the infantry uh, during the initial assault in 2003, the, the opening of Operation Iraqi Freedom. In a number of cases, uh, uh, our adversaries had knocked down some bridges uh, to try and slow down or halt our progress. Uh, there were a number of occasions where this vehicle right here just simply went straight across the water, uh, uh, crossing that body of water, whether it was a, uh, uh, a reservoir or a small river, uh, this vehicle can just uh, continue on. Well, sir, you know, right now I'd like to see if we can actually get the switch to the picture in picture here to see what's actually going on on the beach. Uh, see if you can describe the scene right here. See what, what the folks at home are seeing right now. Okay. At this point, uh, uh, they've gotten to one of their intermediate objectives on the beach. They've gotten part of it secure. Uh, the ramp is down, so the infantry is out. Uh, again, it's that mechanized infantry combination that makes us potent. Uh, using the, the periscope sights inside of the turret and the radios, we're communicating with the infantry and taking a look at the situation as it unfolds uh, uh, as, we, as we move forward. Okay. Looks like these, these AVs right here are posted security and waiting for the next follow-on wave. And that's exactly it. Okay. Well, sir, um, is there anything else you'd like to add about the maintenance that goes into this? We talked about the tracks, talked about the, the, the uh, impeller actually getting getting these to the beach and then the tracks take over once they get on there. What's the kind of maintenance that's going to actually go into this after this exercise today? This is a very large scale event for you guys. Well, uh, well, two things. First is these Marines are going to have to maintain these vehicles throughout the entire exercise. Uh, the tactical halt, that's the reason that rear crewman is out there with, with a wrench, uh, uh, pliers, a flashlight, and a rag checking out the, the entire suspension system. He's going to they are going to uh, maintain these vehicles the entire time. So there's literally no downtime for these Marines today? Practically none whatsoever. I mean, they, they do need to get some rest eventually to keep them effective and in the fight. But through the tactical operation, through the tactical uh, progress of this exercise, they're going to be maintaining these, uh, these vehicles the entire time. Uh, when this uh, exercise is over, there's going to be a lot of uh, maintaining to do. But everything is a training opportunity for us. So it keeps us sharp. That's good. Always a good thing in the Marine Corps. Right now, sir, we're cutting to a wide-angle shot here. Looks okay. like the, uh, the, the, uh, our combat-loaded infantry, as you had uh, previously stated, they have disembarked the AVs and are setting up perimeter security here. They're setting up perimeter security. One of the, uh, one of the downsides of the assault amphibian vehicle is the limited visibility. Uh, the three positions are forward, the driver, the troop commander, and the crew chief are all forward in the vehicle. They don't have a good 360-degree uh, uh, field of view. So as we get uh, off the beach, even though we're still relatively close to it, as we get off the beach, we dismount the infantry uh, to really get that 360 degree view of what's going on. Uh, that'll get the infantry also acclimated from, uh, let's see, they spent probably about a little over an hour inside of those vehicles. So they're getting acclimated to the light, they're getting acclimated to the, uh, to the soil and the ground, and they're getting ready uh, to move forward. Now, most people watching haven't, haven't actually been inside one of these. I've, I know you have, sir, and I've <laughs> had the pleasure of riding in uh, tracks many times before. So uh, it's pretty loud. It's, it's, it's cramped, and I know that they'll, they'll maxim is, hey, always fit one more. We, we can always fit one more, and I've got to tell you, it, it is dark. Uh, it is difficult to maintain that situational awareness, especially for the infantry. They're not sure what they're going to get out and see as soon as they land and, and, uh, and uh, debark. And so that's, again, the uh, purpose of the rear crewman who's uh, listening in on the intercom system, and he can, uh, he can describe what's happening to those infantry who are sitting there waiting to get off the vehicle and get into the fight. And uh, yeah, it's loud. It can get smoky a little bit sometimes, uh, depending on the ambient temperatures outside. It's either going to be cold on the inside or hot on the inside, but a bad ride's better than a good walk any day. That's true. And now the, now the, the infantry marines may have uh, hopped out of uh, the AVs, and obviously they've lost a little bit of protection, a little bit of cover from that. But I don't think they're complete. Uh, they're they're not completely out in the open, mainly because of the, the main guns on those AVs. Right. They're they're in the area, and uh, again with that 50 caliber and that 40 millimeter uh, uh, system on there, uh, they they can receive direct fire support from that vehicle. So 
they're off the vehicle, but they're pretty close. And if they get to, if they need to move, within moments they can be back in that vehicle and on the move. All right, sir. I'd like to uh, kind of shift the discussion over to a little bit bro more broad topic of amphibious operations and partnering with our, our allies in the Pacific in, in conjunction with those. Now, as we stated earlier, you were the uh, amphibious operations expert, uh, served as a military aide on the U.S. House of Representatives. Can you tell me a little bit about your work there? Absolutely. It was a very interesting uh, uh, tour of duty. Uh, it was the uh, military legislative aide was the exact title. And uh, in a lot of ways, uh, we just helped uh, members of Congress uh, uh, bridge that gap between uh, uh, what was happening in the Pentagon and what was happening on Capitol Hill. We, we were uh, uh, translating, so to speak. I mean, we, we have a certain jargon. We have a certain way we, we, we speak to each other uh, in, in inside of the Department of Defense, and, and our job was to, to be able to bridge that gap with members of Congress and, and also uh, do the opposite. Also, there, there's, there's a certain way that information travels around Capitol Hill, and our job was to help translate that uh, back over to the Department of Defense and really serve as that liaison in between. Uh, uh, what was very rewarding about that was uh, 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 having access to that information and being able to play what I think was a, a pretty critical role in doing so, uh, the payback tour, so to speak, was at the uh, Marine Corps Combat Development Command uh, in Quantico, Virginia, assisting in preparing congressional testimony for the Deputy Commandant of the Marine Corps at the time. And, and one of those uh, documents was uh, uh, a hearing on amphibious capabilities. Right. Well, we have um, moving. From, you moved as a, uh, as a you worked as an expert on amphibious operations uh, during that time, and now here you're clearly still bringing that expertise to the table every day here at work. A big part of our a big part of our uh, job now at the Marine Corps is partnering with our allies, especially Absolutely. as we shifted towards the Pacific. Here on Camp Pendleton right now, actually, as part of Exercise Steel Night, uh, Marines with Second Battalion, Fifth Marines are working with the Third Singaporean Guard on Camp Pendleton as part of uh, Exercise Valiant Mark. It's an annual exercise. They do every year with between the First Marine Division and the Singaporeans. Um, sir, can you just talk just a little bit about how important this partnering piece is with our Pacific allies and, and in relation to your amphibious capabilities as well? Absolutely. Uh, uh, as we discussed earlier, as we shift out from uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, we, we have uh, reset ourselves to engage, respond, and project. The amphibious capability is, is I believe, critical all three of those missions, engage, respond, and project. As far as the engagement goes, uh, as we lose access, so to speak, we have fewer forward bases. It's just a fact. Uh, we, we may have to uh, uh, create access in a certain area. Our amphibious forces do that, but prior to that, uh, through security cooperation and assistance, through bilateral training with our, uh, our, our allied partners, uh, we can certainly uh, facilitate this strategic realignment in the Pacific. Uh, one company, like I mentioned, we, we've got uh, uh, five line companies in the third assault amphibian battalion. Right. One company is in a constant rotation over to Okinawa, Japan as part of the unit deployment program. Okay. And uh, from that position, they conduct a number of bilateral training exercises with the Japanese, with the Filipinos. Uh, we're in a position to uh, train with our other partners in the Pacific, the Australians. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, We've got uh, the Singaporeans here. Right, and that's very relevant. It's, it's uh, Exercise Valiant Mark is being conducted in conjunction with Steel Night. Yes. Uh, obviously, we've start, kicked off Steel Night. You've seen behind us today. And uh, we've had we've also had um, some of our Marines reporting on uh, some of the work that your Marines with 3rd third, third Assault Amphibian Battalion have done with the Singaporean Guard and 2-5. So uh, hopefully, shortly, we can cut to a report from uh, Sergeant Alfred Lopez on this Valiant, on this Valiant Mark training. Now, um, on... During this training, we actually they were actually came out and did familiarization training with yes. the AAVs. Can you talk through just a little bit about what your Marines were, were showing the Singaporean Marines? Okay, absolutely. Uh, the, the the first thing is is just learning how to get on and off the vehicle. It may sound very simple, but uh, uh, getting up and down that ramp, finding your positions uh, inside of that vehicle, and understanding uh, uh, ingress and egress uh, procedures. Operating in the water, uh, each of our uh, embarked infantrymen must wear a flotation device and a life-saving device there. Uh, getting used to that is, is also something. And, and, and how to uh, store your gear in conjunction with the personnel inside of the back of that vehicle is interesting. Situational awareness. You, you, you uh, get off of the back of the vehicle 
is, is actually difficult to establish. Uh, if you've been driving around and, and you're being dropped off in an area you're not familiar with, uh, uh, getting off the vehicle and establishing that situational awareness immediately right. is a, a small unit leadership tactic, which is, you well, know, I mean, it, it takes e even our Marines takes a little bit of getting right. used to. So with a foreign nation, right. it takes a little bit more to get used to. Well, it sounds like that, that uh, partnership has been going well. It's been going strong for a few, yes. for many years now with 1st Marine Division and the Singaporean Guard. I know when Sergeant, Sergeant Lopez was out there working with them and working with your, your Marines at Third Tracks, uh, they also did they also did the dismounted infantry piece like yes. we have seen behind us today and that we've already described. They did uh, close quarters combat training within yes. the Mount Town that's actually just beyond beyond the tent we're sitting in, in right here. Can you just t talk about moving from, from the AVs and then up to this Mount Town? What kind of things would they be looking at in training? Okay, it's, it's the integration piece is, is exactly what you're right. So as far as the dismounted infantry, it's getting used to having those fire support assets right there, knowing how to call for them and knowing how to coordinate them into the scheme and maneuver. Uh, that, that takes uh, uh, quite a bit of training to do it and do it safely and effectively. Right. Uh, also understanding that uh, with the capabilities uh, inside the AV, you can call in additional air assets or indirect fire assets. That takes quite a bit of training. All right, sir, it looks like we got, uh, right now it looks like these Marines are unloading, uh, moving some gear to a different position as everybody else is supply, applied uh, security on the beach right now. Looks like they're moving on to the next phase. And, and just about now, it looks like the last, the last of your waves are, are hitting the beach. Um, Final platoon is coming in now. As the final wave of your AVs from Bravo Company are hitting the beach, sir, what's the next? What's the next move for your company? Oh, they're going to move uh, to the inland objectives. Uh, there's a number of different ways that that man that that maneuver is going to occur. Whether it's uh, uh, bounding or an Overwatch position, that's going to be determined by the enemy threat and the type of the terrain that's uh, that's out there. Uh, this is where it's critical again to form that relationship with the infantry. Uh, we, we've got to understand each other's language, we've got to understand each other's skills and the needs so we can best support them. We are in a supporting role at this point, but we play a critical role in, in that support because we can get them there quickly, get them there safely, and provide that direct fire support all the way through. Yes, sir. Right now we're taking a look at some, uh, I believe these are infantry marines now, I saw them taking off life jackets, and that's a requirement anytime they're in, in these vehicles, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, sir. And that's obvi ob for obvious reasons they wear this. And now that they're out on the sand, they're getting out of those and, th and then prepping for the, uh, the following operations. These Marines have not dropped their gear quite yet because they're providing security as their, other, their uh, fellow Marines are get getting ready to roll up onto the beach. Now, sir, we're talking about the uh, landing force and everything. Can you tell me a little bit about um, who is actually conducting that landing today as the, as the ground, ground force commander? It's going to be uh, 3rd Battalion, 1st Marines, as I understand it, under Lieutenant Colonel uh, Tippett. That's correct. And so, and, and we are just one part of it. I mean, that, that is the true and robust nature of the MAGTAF, the Marine Air Ground Task Force. Th this is just one of the many elements that's, uh, that's that would be uh, employed uh, in, a, in a joint forcible entry operation. We've secured the, the lodgement. We've opened up uh, the landing site. We've provided security on the beach. And I believe uh, the landing craft air cushion is going to be coming in with the follow-on forces, the light armored vehicles, the combat engineers, uh, tanks, artillery. Uh, we've opened up that door and provided that conduit for them to come through. Uh, concurrently, uh, based on the scenario, based on the threat, uh, there'd be a, hel a helleborn landing force that would come in. Right. And behind all of that is the sustainment to keep us going. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's a synergy. And it, it, it's, uh, uh, you know, we're here to, to open up that door to uh, begin that momentum and maintain that tempo all the way through. Because this is a training exercise and there's not uh, a lot of live fire right now, we just want to stick to the basic building blocks to, to get this very critical part uh, as part of our muscle memory right here and now. And obviously this has been, it's been a while since we've conducted as, as a Marine Corps. Marine Corps conducting um, this kind of like large-scale amphibious landing operation since we've been doing things like uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Do you see us doing more of this in the future? Oh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we, we look forward to every single opportunity that, that we can get to practice this. Like I said, this is critical. This is a, a service-defining capability for us, this combined mechanized infantry team. And then, you know, that is supported by the Marine Corps Navy team. Uh, uh, we, we've really uh, got to focus on this every chance that we get. Uh, there are a number of opportunities through the year uh, 
Uh, with, we've got Steel Knight right now, Iron Fist with the uh, Japanese, uh, Dawn Blitz, Pacific Horizon. There are a number of large-scale exercises, but they're only possible if we get out and practice the individual tactics, techniques, and procedures every opportunity that we get. All right, sir. Well, hey, I think that's about all the time we have for you today, but um, I want to thank you for coming out and sharing your knowledge. Is there any, anything you'd like to add before we step off here? Uh, just one last thing, if I can. I, I've got to tell you, I, I'm immensely proud of the Marines and sailors who put the hard work and effort into this every single day and make it look as seamless as it is right now because there, there is, is you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of preparation and training that go into these exercises to make them come off this way. Very proud of the Marines, and I'm, and I'm excited about the opportunity to come out here. Well, sir, thank you for taking the time today and sharing some of your knowledge and expertise on amphibious operations. But that's about all the time we have for you. Uh, it's good to see you, and hopefully we talk again. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And for now, we're going to go ahead and take a quick little break uh, here at Exercise Field Night. We'll be back in a few minutes live at Red Beach in Camp Pendleton, California.